without objection, then we will skip to item eight on our agenda, our green themes presentation on climate change and health impacts by Lorraine Cameron, a senior environmental epidemiologist, the Michigan Climate and Health Adaptation Program, the Division of Environmental Health, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Thank goodness that was all written down here. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm, uh, we're so pleased to have you. Thank you for coming along this evening, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Okay. Um, is the mic about it right? Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. All right. So um, thanks for the invitation. I actually live down in Cornell Woods, not that far away, so um, I'm happy to come and find out what's going on in my own community and talk to you about what I've been doing at, at the uh, state of Michigan. And... Um, I wanted to also acknowledge um, Aaron Ferguson, who I think originally reached out to. Aaron's our program manager, and he's been working with the Michigan Municipal League in their uh, Green Communities program for a number of years. Uh, he's actually at another conference this evening in Grand Rapids having to do with, um, with parks and recreation and their intersection with public health. So um, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for your invite. and. Um, I'll proceed. How tight do you want me to stick to the timetable? I, I think if, if you were to go 20 or, or, or 25 minutes, that would be okay. excellent. And uh, we can be informal if people have any questions anytime. Just yell. Yeah, I'll try to look over here, but I'm also looking over here, so let me know. And Jonathan, who's one of our staff epidemiologists, you can kind of give me the high sign. Okay. All right, thanks. All right, so um, so I always like to put my objectives of why I'm speaking out because this helps me organize my thoughts. And really what I want to try to do in the next 20 minutes or so is, first of all, describe our Michigan Climate and Health Adaptation Program uh, and some of the information that we've compiled uh, over the last seven years. We've been funded about what we've learned about climate in Michigan, what are the important human health, uh, issues, who's at risk and where are they, and how interventions can be used to help communities adapt. And secondly, talk a little bit about how public health can be integrated into local climate or adaptation planning um, and where you can get more information. So just a little bit of background about our program. So I'm with the state of Michigan in the, what used to be called the health department. Uh, we are now the part of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, as you said. Um, and since 2009, we've had funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, along with uh, 16 other states and two cities, uh, under a program called the Climate Ready States and Cities Initiative. And this is a group that has been working on the adaptation end. So uh, talking less about mitigation and I'll get into what those terms mean if you guys aren't familiar with, but less about reducing greenhouse gases and more with dealing with the effects that we are seeing now from a changing climate. So I'm happy to hear that Jeff Andreessen is coming to speak with you. He worked with us quite a bit uh, on our program, and I'm going to be pre presenting some data that he, uh, his program gave us. Uh, this acronym here, GLISA, is the Great Lakes Integrated Science and Assessment Center. It's, believe it or not, jointly run by the University of Michigan and Michigan State University climatology programs. Um, and they've spent a lot of time looking specifically at Michigan and the Great Lakes climate, both past and projecting into the future. So I'm going to run through these quickly because you'll get a lot more details from Jeff a little later this um, spring. So this map shows you what we know historically about the Great Lakes in area of Michigan, and this is from uh, national data, the National Climate Assessment. And what it shows you in a nutshell is that um, we've been warming up. Since 1960, uh, the average annual temperature has gone up about three degrees Fahrenheit, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you think about your own body and if you were at 101 versus 98, you wouldn't be doing so hot. So uh, uh, the other thing to, that you'll notice is that the red on the map, which is the greatest rate of change, is further north. And this is really characteristic of climate, of what's happening with our climate, that the 
the further away from the equator, the more drastic the changes are, or have been or, and will continue to be occurring. And as you see here, I've noted that Michigan has warmed faster than the national rate of warming historically since the 60s, and more in northern Michigan than southern. So um, the climatologists have used the information they have about greenhouse gases and climate patterns, and they've projected for us into the f not the far future, but you know, the next 50 years or so, and we see that um, we are projecting to be warming another one and a half to four and a half degrees uh, over that time period, but it's not even across the state and it's not even across the season. So what we're seeing is that in the winter, in particular, things are warming more rapidly, and we sort of noticed how winters have been less severe in general. Uh, in the past, and that's going to continue in the future, but also uh, we've noticed that um, the north is seeing more extreme changes in these seasons. The other important thing to think about when you think about warming temperatures is extreme heat days, or heat waves as we call them. Uh, when it gets above 95 degrees or so, then <coughs> then's when we start getting concerned about human health and about people getting heat uh, illness or heat stress. and um, Historically, Michigan has had some heat uh, waves, which have been threats to human health. Uh, not a lot as compared to southern states, but there is a projection that these will be increasing um, again more in the southern part of the state. So climatologists, as I understand it, basically measure two things. They'll measure temperature and they'll measure precipitation, and those are the things that they can project. They, they don't feel as comfortable projecting things like wind patterns, tornadoes, and things like that. So the other part of, of climate change is looking at precipitation. And this map, excuse me, this map shows what's been happening historically again since the 50s. And you see, in general, we've been getting more rain. But it's very variable across the area. And again, it depends on the season. We're going to see more rain in the winter, uh, maybe a little less in the summer. We might even see some droughts. So um, this, again, more severe uh, winter changes in the north and the summer droughts in the south. But the, the real concerning thing in the, in the projections is what's going to be happening with what we call extreme precipitation or heavy rain events which we've defined here as more than one inch in a day. And as you know, Michigan's had some really bad ones in the past. I think it was two summers ago when they got six inches over 24 hours in the Detroit area and had those terrible floods. So um, we are projecting to have more of these extreme precipitation days. Um, again, following sort of a north-south gradient where you see that um, it's going to go up by as much as 30 percent in the upper peninsula. but we're expecting it to go up in the future, something we're dealing with now, actually. Am I going too fast for you guys? Are you, are you okay? All right. Um, and no questions so far? As I say, I'm not a climatologist, so I'm sure Jeff will give you much more uh, in-depth description. So this is sort of my understanding of the important points when we think about health. So as part of our project, we worked with the climatologists in Michigan to look at these changes that are happening in Michigan, and then we tried to figure out what are the impacts on health. And we identified five areas where we think it's important uh, health impacts for our state. And this chart here sort of summarizes the, what we're calling the key health outcomes. These are things that will affect a lot of people and that are substantial effects. So the first one I have listed here is respiratory diseases, and so with the increases in heat um, and temperature, we're expecting more um, what I'm calling here a, a biophysical parameter. That just means something that's changing due to the change in climate that is that's actually having an impact on health. So the warming and the, is leading to more air pollution, which is leading to more stress on the respiratory system. Uh, we are projecting that we may see more 
respiratory problems in the future with the changes in climate, with the changes in precipitation, with more mold and pollen, uh, also giving people more uh, respiratory problems. As I mentioned, with heat, you have direct effects of heat illness. Um, again, we're projecting those to go up as, it's, as we have warmer summers. Um, because of the changes in, from, uh, in winter precipitation, for example, from snow to rain or freezing rain, we're, we're thinking that there's going to be more storms that can lead to um, power outages, which are hazardous, because people then will get generators and if they don't install the generator properly, they can get carbon monoxide poisoning. Plus the other uh, things that can happen during a storm that disrupt uh, people's ability to um, be healthy and, and get to where they need to go, the disruptions to transportation, other things. Uh, with the increased temperature, uh, sorry, with the increased precipitation, we're, we're thinking that we may have to be looking at waterborne diseases and finally, um, looking at vector-borne diseases uh, possibly going up with more mosquitoes and more ticks. And I'm going to break that down a little bit more for you, so I know I'm going, that's kind of a quick summary. So first, talk about air pollution and climate change. So um, as the temperature warms, we can have what are called air stagnation. So when the, and, and you'll see this a lot more in urban areas, like in Detroit, where you'll get these smog effects where the hot air just parks, and it does, you don't have a lot of movement of air, and so the, whatever fumes are from uh, traffic, industry, whatever, they stay put and they accumulate. With the warmth uh, and temperature, we expect that to go up. We also expect in places where they're using coal, in particular for um, uh, generating electricity, such as the old power plant in Lansing, which I, they're going to be ch changing out. Um, if in the summer when it's hot, there'll be more demand for electricity. You have more coal burnt. You have more uh, pollution coming off of those heating plants, I mean those energy plants. Um, we could have the formation of ozone, which you've heard about uh, during the ozone action days, uh, a lot of times from car exhaust with the the warmer temperatures, the chemical reaction can cause the formation of ozone, which irritates the lungs. And finally, um, something that people don't think about, but this is probably something that planners can really get their heads around, is um, with the warming temperatures, we have a longer growing season. That means we have a longer season for pollen, which means we have a longer allergy season. And especially ragweed seems to love warm temperatures and lots of carbon dioxide. And so there actually are some studies saying that um, ragweed is going to become more irritating with climate change. Um, and finally, um, as I mentioned, if, if we have more rain and flooding, we're going to have more mold uh, <coughs> accumulating afterwards. And that's also something that the mold spores get in the air and they can be irritating. I don't know how much you've looked at the data that is available about air pollution in Michigan, but this map takes data from the EPA, you know, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality measures particulate and ozone air pollution and uh, for EPA, and they send that to EPA, and we've been able to map the average um, averages by county. Um, for both ozone, which is on the left map, and PM2.5, which is a very small particle that can get into the lungs on the right-hand side. And as you can see, um, I don't know if I have a little pointer thing, but so I believe that's Ingham County. I don't know, you can't even see that. So if you look at where Ingham County is, which is sort of in the middle, we're okay as far as ozone compared to the rest of the state. Our average is only two days above the standard, whereas the Michigan average is 3.6. But we're not doing so hot with particulates. We're above the state average, which is 9.7. Our average is 11.4. Um, so that's something to be aware of um, as we go forward, that this is, this is going to be an issue um, with the warming 
uh, temperatures and with more generation of air pollution. Um, some people are kind of surprised to see that little band of high ozone along Lake Michigan, and that's actually blows across the lake from Chicago and Milwaukee, so air pollution can travel quite a ways. I don't have any data that's specific to Michigan about pollen levels. Uh, we only have one pollen measuring station that's recognized in the state, and it's over in uh, St. Clair Shore, so it doesn't do us a whole lot of good out here in, in mid-Michigan. But if you look at this um, pic picture that's from a, uh, an EPA document, uh, there are some researchers that have studied the change in the ragweed season from 1995 to 2013, and you can see as you go further north, the ragweed season has gotten bigger, it has grown more. So the um, increase since the 90s for the latitude, which is around Michigan, is somewhere around 15 days. So that means you have two more weeks of misery if you have asthma or allergies, thanks to the warming climate since the 90s, and we expect that trend to continue. And as I also mentioned, with an increase in carbon dioxide, we expect some of the pollen to actually become more irritating. I talked about heat causing uh, health effects. This is a graph from 2012, which you might remember was a particularly hot summer statewide. And we had a really um, big <coughs> statewide heat event in the early part of July, which you can see there's a peak uh, with purple and green bars, and this is people that have come to the emergency departments in Michigan complaining about dehydration or heat uh, illness or um, sun, sun poisoning, things like that. And the solid line shows the, the average daily temperature, and they track pretty closely. So this is something as we we would expect again to be increasing in the future as the temperatures get hotter in the summer. We expect more people to be visiting um, emergency departments with heat-related complaints. And here's from the subsequent year, but it kind of gives you the idea of the distribution by region of these heat complaints. This was another period when the state was pretty much in a statewide heat uh, heat event and. Um, Region 1, which is mid-Michigan, you can see we had um, 524 people uh, visiting emergency departments with heat-related illness. So it does have an impact on people's health. And it's something that we can plan for and um, respond to. In terms of storms, um, there's a number of uh, outcomes. And this picture is from Grand Rapids, a couple years ago, remember when they had the big flood, uh, you can see some of the issues we worry about, physical injuries, drowning, motor vehicle accidents, uh, the mold and allergy issue, exposure to um, infectious agents uh, in the water, food and waterborne illnesses, um, people are d displaced from their homes, uh, emergency services are interrupted. So there's a lot of uh, impacts from flooding events. Just to give you a picture of what Ingham County looks like, I, I couldn't get these statistics for the township, but there is a database that NOAA has of storm events, and you can see all the storms since 1996 that were severe enough to cause deaths, injuries, something they call significant property damage uh, or disruption or were kind of just weird. Um, and if you look at the, the um, chart, you can see that um, the most common types of storms that have been significant in Ingham County were thunderstorms or high winds. There was almost half of the storms here. Uh, but winter storms were right behind them with 25%, and this includes ice storms, blizzards, and this, these are the sort of things that uh, can cause a lot of, of problems uh, with people's health. 
we've had a fair number of hailstorms, and then there's a variety of other things. The database only recorded two injuries and two deaths, however, and those were all related to tornadoes. Um, but we have an average of 21 significant storms per year in the county, so that's not insignificant, and it's something that can be planned for in communities to have uh, emergency preparedness, to have shelters, and to have um, have response plans when the power goes out during Christmas because the ice brought the lines down. You probably remember that one. I sure do. <laughs> this is an example from that storm of uh, carbon monoxide poisoning visits to emergency department, and you can see we were able to determine that 400,000 people in the state lost power, and we had, uh, and the arrow shows when the power, the, the date the power went out, which was December 22nd, and you can see that blue peak right afterwards, that's the 81 visits that uh, were made to emergency departments related to carbon monoxide poisoning. And we think, as I mentioned, it's most likely people operating generators uh, unsafely and getting the fumes from the generator in their house. So this is something, again, a community can prepare for, they can educate. Uh, I know some communities that have uh, put in regulations, for example, to, <coughs> just like smoke detectors, to have CO monitors in apartment buildings, they have fire departments go out and hand them out and educate people. There's ways to prepare for this to reduce the impact on health. This graph kind of summarizes some of the effects of extreme weather, but I want to point out the, the statistic that is circled. It says 51 percent of waterborne disease outbreaks uh, followed extreme precipitation events. <coughs> this, I think, is going to be a big problem for us in Michigan uh, going forward. Um, as you know, extreme rain can cause flooding, that can cause uh, sewer and septic to mobilize and it can contaminate homes, surface waters, and well waters. Um, and this is something that I think we'll be addressing statewide. So I looked, again, I couldn't find good statistics for uh, Meridian Township, but I looked up for Ingham County what I could find out about some of the risks. And um, turns out, at least for the statewide data, the only reliable data I could find on well and septic was from 1990 census of housing. After that point, the federal government stopped collecting that data. But this is the data DEQ also uses to project. And at the time, if you can see on the, the slide here, about 51% of households use private well and septic rather than public water. Now, if you take that 51% and you multiply it by the current population of Ingham County, you can see that there's about 62,000 people in Ingham County that are roughly that are on well and septic. This could have changed a little bit with development. I don't know. You probably have better statistics locally than I was able to get for the state, but it's a lot of people. Um, the county health department reported an average of 56, 57 septic failures they investigate per year, which we know is not everything. Um, so that's a little bit concerning. You may be aware that the governor has a water strategy which talks about septic and water quality and whether the state needs to have a septic code. And it turns out that Michigan has the distinction of being the only state in the union that doesn't have a statewide septic code. So that's kind of uh, not where we want to be, I think. Um, and the final point on this slide, uh, I just want to, you may be familiar, there was a paper that came out from some researchers at Michigan State University in 2015 where they sampled watersheds in the Lower Peninsula and found 100% of our watersheds had human fecal contamination. Now, I don't know about you, but that bothers me. <laughs> uh, and I think this is an area that there's going to be a lot of concern at the state level, but within the township, it's something that I know you're interested in as well and might want to think about how your
planning can address that. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about bugs. <laughs> I'm not an entomologist, but um, we do have one at the State Health Department, and he does, uh, he collects information on human cases of Lyme disease, which is carried by the black-legged tick, and he also does uh, surveys for ticks. You can see on this map there's dark red counties and there's sort of pink counties. The pink counties have the ticks. The red counties have the ticks that are infected or people have gotten Lyme disease from being in that county. And you'll notice that Ingham County is a red county, so that means we have infected ticks here. And I know from what he's told me that he has found samples both in Lansing and in Bath Township of infected ticks. So something for the township to think about, especially when they're thinking about parks and walkways, what needs to be done to protect citizens from being exposed to potentially infected ticks. And there are methods to do that. Just really quickly, I wanted to mention planners. I, I don't know if, if anyone here is uh, formally trained as a planner, but they have their, okay, so you have your roots in public health from the sanitary movements of the early 20th century. So you're our brothers. Um, we are interested in, in working with you, with planners, to bring the public health lens into the master planning. Um, this slide refers to a training that our department did with a nonprofit called LEA, which is, uh, uh, promotes regional planning. And so we've developed some materials for, for planners to learn about how to look at public health issues, and I think not just for things like I've talked about with climate, but more generally uh, other public health issues. Uh, and this is just sort of the, the process that Leah had developed. Um, educate, engage stakeholders, use data. Um, you can look for people's sensitivity. Uh, we know people who are elderly or are already uh, impaired in terms of their health can be more sensitive. They have less reserve to respond when there's a, uh, a stress on them, like a heat event or a storm or a flood. So also people who are um, low income have less resources. So in your township, you can figure out where those people are, and those are your vulnerable people. You can also look at where what parts of your township have potential for exposure to hazards. Um, where are they, where are the floodplains? Where do storms typically occur? And that's something that I showed you on a statewide map. Where are your septic combined sewers? I don't know if they're all gone here. I think they are, I hope. <laughs> They've been all separated. Um, where the pirate wells are, where your green spaces are that keep things cool, where the heavy traffic is, where you have exhaust. And, and this area, Meridian has done a lot already. I know they've done some things to reduce uh, exhaust with buses and things. So um, this is the other part of vulnerability. And just to show you really quickly, other communities have actually been able to take these factors and map and say, these are the neighborhoods that we need to concentrate on. You can see this is a map of Detroit looking at heat and flooding. The dark colors are the high uh, highly vulnerable area. So those are the folks that they need to think about first in terms of, of uh, preparing for these events or responding. Finally, I hope this looks familiar to a few of you, the Mid-Michigan HIA Toolkit, uh, which was developed by the Ingham County Health Department, Michigan State University. Um, also, Barry Eaton at Mid-Michigan Health Departments and the Tri-County Regional Planning Commission, and I know that some folks here in the township worked on this. Uh, Janine Sino in Ingham County Health Department manages this project. This link has some really great mapping capabilities that you can use for your uh, climate planning. Um, Janine mentioned to me that Meridian Township does a lot already using the toolkit in terms of um, looking at new projects. Uh, they've done, I think, 21 last year that she mentioned to me, but you can also use it 
for your climate planning to look at your climate vulnerable areas. You can look at your floodplains, for example, using this tool. So it's a great tool. I wish we had it for the entire state. Um, I think I will leave you there. Uh, we have lots of resources here listed with links. I'll leave these slides um, with you guys. Please feel free to contact myself or Jonathan or Aaron at the State Health Department. Um, there are some other uh, resources here from American Public Health Association, LEA, uh, the National Climate and Health Assessment, and so forth. And I uh, thank you for your time. I'll, I'll try one. Okay. Trying to trying to digest all of this. No, it's a lot. I'm sorry. One slide that I saw. You had the number of days of increase of uh, ragweed. Oh yes. And I wondered, was that starting f from the same place? I mean, might the UP showed. Yes, the UP showed 27 days increase. Would they have been at a much lower level, I presume, than let's say down around Lansing, which is going to have 10 more days? Probably, yeah. These actually, this study used pollen monitoring stations that were in operation for quite a while since the 90s. So those dots are actually cities. They're not in Michigan. I think. There's like in Wisconsin and Minnesota, and then there's... Oh, okay. But they're on the same latitude as Michigan. But yes, mm -hmm. I think you're seeing is a rate of change. And, and kind of if you think about like the, uh, the USDA planning zones, how they've been changing over time, if you're familiar with those, if you're mm -hmm. a gardener, it's the same sort of thing. I mean, we're starting from a cooler place, but we're warming up fast. Mm -hmm. We're not as hot as Alabama, um, although in 100 years they say we may be like Arkansas. <laughs> but yes, that's, you're, you're ex absolutely correct. Okay. Very perceptive, too. That's, that's <laughs> big numbers up there in the north. Yeah, yeah. Well, as I mentioned, what's happening with the changing climate is that things are changing faster the further north you go. Sure. I mean, the polar ice caps melting, that's rapid. In Alaska, it's just devastating change. But they're starting from a cooler place, but they're warming up quickly. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. You talked about water quality. Yes. Do you have any data on, um, do you have any data on the increase in uh, harmful algae blooms in the inland lakes? I mean, I know that there's a lot on ocean. Mm -hmm. Yes. But how about inland lakes? The people who would have any information would probably be, I believe the local health departments would go out and measure um, and report it to the Department of Environmental Quality. They don't sample, and so this is not my area, so I'm not 100% sure, but I believe they typically don't sample everywhere every year. Um, so they kind of go on historically where there have been problems. But that would probably also be increasing both with the warming temperatures and more runoff, bringing more nutrients into inland lakes, just like they did with Lake Erie. Right. And there's a lot of action around Lake Erie, but I guess because it's so big and it's a major drinking water source um, for Toledo and also Monroe. Um, but uh, it is a concern elsewhere. I, just, I don't know how much data there is. Yeah, I was just curious because I've seen a lot of data for ocean yes. and marine environments, but I can't think of any data for inland lakes. It is measured. I don't know the mechanism. I don't know if, on, if somebody just complains and then they go out and measure. I think it sort of depends on the use of the lake, too, if it's a big lake that gets a lot of uh, 
use as a beach, for example, they might be monitored more closely. It, and, you know, they do also do the beach monitoring for uh, coliforms, which is the right. human fecal. And there's sort of a protocol for that. Um, Do they see increases in coliform? Nicole, yeah. Or even in an increase in beach closures? Um, I haven't looked at that, but I think it is, people think it's a problem. I know, not here, but up in Charlevoix, <coughs> that they have some major concerns about contamination of Lake Charlevoix and the, the issue of septic there. And I've heard that similar problem around Lake Lansing, but I don't know specifically. Um, I would expect if you have a lot of runoff into the lake, you would have more yeah. problems. And some of that depends on the soil type. And we have pretty impervious soil. Some areas where it's sandy, it goes right down. It's not as big a problem. But again, that's more of a Department of Environmental Quality thing. That's their responsibility right now to do those measurements with the local health department. Before, before I was guessing, I would say, yeah, it's a problem. I mean, just based on the fact that we're finding it in all the watersheds, it's, and it's human. It's not coming from animal confinement. It's not coming from dog waste. It's they use some sort of a DNA identification as it was human fecal. So. I don't know, anyone here a, a My water, water chemist or a microbiologist? Nope. I'll make that a homework problem yeah. this uh, in yeah, air yeah. pollution this semester. Oh, ah. Uh, well, Joan Rose might know the answer to that question if you know. I know Joan. <laughs> if you can get a hold of her, ask her. I wonder if you could uh, talk a little about the role of the state uh, government related to adaptation. Uh, okay. are, are there any statewide initiatives kind of planned to kind of deal with these issues? Uh, Okay. Um, well, the, Governor Granholm had a climate action plan. When she left, as far as I know, that plan was shelved. There have been activities not only within our health department but other parts of state government to try to grapple with the issue of climate. I know, for example, MDOT, Department of Transportation, has been looking at impacts on infrastructure around major roadways. Um, I know that there are folks in ag that are looking at issues in forestry and so forth. I think it's been sort of done very quietly. Um, I don't think there's a, uh, there's no, there's no official state policy or official climate, state climate action plan since the Grand Home Plan. So what we're doing, for example, is um, we are working as a grantee to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And this falls kind of within our mandate to pr prevent or mitigate diseases in the state. So I don't know if that's answering your question, but I'd, I'd, I'd say that there's no policy per se that I'm aware of that it encompasses all state government. I think each department or several departments within state government are thinking about. I know, for example, state police has been looking at a lot, for example, in terms of, you know, critical infrastructure and emergency response and things like that. And as I mentioned, ag. I know um, extension is doing a lot. Uh, they're quasi-governmental, I guess. They're really part of MSU. Um, but there's nothing that you can point at, I got a state website that is all encompassing. I'm sorry, I can't be more specific. No, that's <laughs> but certainly if you have any questions about the health end, we'll do our best to respond. Can I answer any other questions? Yes, I sir. Could, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. You mentioned Lyme disease yes. and black lake ticks. Yes. Yes. Could you repeat the question? Yeah. Uh, so the question was with regards to Lyme disease. And let me see. I brought an extra slide on that. And the black legged tick. And yeah, there it is. Um, and what the vector for the tick is. Well, 
Um, it turns out that deer, th these ticks do like deer, but they also like other mammals, so they like mice and other rodents, and they'll even uh, attach to birds. So um, there's been some investigation about culling deer herds as a way to prevent Lyme disease, if that's what you're getting at. And from what I understand, talking to Eric, who's our uh, medical entomologist, that's not very effective because there's so many deer. Like if you killed every deer in Meridian Township, they just come in from other places and it'd be like nothing happened. Uh, so the types of controls would affect some of these other things that he listed here. Um, and this is what he's done in some places in the state, like on the west side where they, it's a really big issue. They'll have public education in parks. They'll have signs up reminding people to check for ticks, how to, you know, wear the coverings, you know, tuck in your pant legs and such, uh, spray with, um, with insecticide. And, and then the cultural landscape controls, which is also sort of a more of a, uh, infrastructure type of thing where you can actually, if you remove the foliage from around the trail so that the ticks can't hang on there and when you brush up against it, it jumps on you. And these desiccation barriers which you put in strips where it's dry and they don't like that. Um, so there are some mechanisms that people have developed and mostly from states where it's really rampant such as west of us in Wisconsin and and Minnesota, or east of us in New England. I mean, we're sort of in the middle, it's coming. We're in the pincher. Um, but they have hundreds and hundreds of cases a year, and so they've developed some of these methods. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, was there another question? Well, I'm uh, making a, a list of, of things that seem like uh, they're worth following up on from, from your presentation. Okay. And uh, uh, the easy thing to do is to ask the staff to report back to us on all these things, but um, uh, there, there will be other ways of, of handling this. Um, you uh, posed a specific question about the uh, Mid-Michigan Health Impacts Assessment Toolkit and yes. the degree to which that's being regularly implemented in evaluating uh, development projects in the township. Yeah. There was uh, an issue of uh, whether there is or could be uh, any regulation of uh, or promotion of CO2 monitors or CO monitors in, in order to avoid those those accidental poisonings. Yes. Um, there's then a set of questions around uh, the issue of increased uh, rainfall that have to do with uh, uh, potential uh, vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, and those uh, come down to uh, how many uh, private well and septic systems are there in the township, and how are they? Uh, regulated, from what you said, there is no statewide regulation of those. So that's correct. It, it raises the question of what, if any, local regulation is there, or, or should there be? Well, wait. Let me correct myself. There is no uh, standard for septic, and in terms of installing, I believe there are regulation okay. for both a well and a septic, and there may be local, like the county may have a regulation, like a point of sale inspections so I want to be okay. clear I, it doesn't mean like they're just nothing it's but not it's not free for all it's, it's regulated at the county level which okay. actually means that there's 81 different sets of regulations 81 one for every county yeah and mm -hmm. um, you know you also have to think about how much staff they have to enforce any inspections or regulations if you have okay. thousands and you have two sanitarians in Ingham County, and I don't know how many they have, but yes. And the last one was the question of uh, whether there are any combined sanitary storm sewers in the township or what the potential is for cross-contamination in the case of, uh, of flooding. That has been an issue elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I, as I said, I don't know. I think, I know Lansing has separated their sewers and there's been a project going on since the 80s, I think. Um, so probably they're separated here. It's just some of the, I do know some of the older cities like Detroit, they still have combined sewers. Mm -hmm. And they have big problems when it rains. 
So those are some of the things you could consider. There may be other things that make more sense for the township, which you would know better than I. Um, so those sound like a, a mix of, of questions that might be posed uh, either to uh, building and engineering or to public works, to uh, county authorities, if, if we wanted to mm -hmm. learn more. Right, and I mean, you can look at your history here in the township to identify which seem to be the big issues historically, because what I'm seeing when I look at the issues on climate change, it's like it's going to be more of whatever we're getting now. You know, if we get mm -hmm. floods now, we're going to get more floods in the future. And uh, if we have heat events now, we're going to get more heat events in the future. That's, I know, a simplification, but that might give you some guidance as to, you know, if there's been a history in the past of like a lot of power outages, for example. Right. Well, certainly the uh, the township uh, mounted quite a, a vigorous response to the the big ice storm that you referenced, and uh, it sounds as if, uh, in general, uh, folks were pretty pleased that the township took an active uh, uh, and, and mm -hmm. rapid uh, role in that. Uh, and it seems in this transition from a, a colder to a, a warmer uh, climate that um, one might expect maybe some of those ice events to be uh, happening that might in the past have been s snow events. Mm -hmm. So that, that may be an issue uh, for planning going forward, both in public works and emergency services for the township. Yes, and that's my understanding. Great. Other questions? Okay. Well, thank well, you. Thank you once again for coming tonight. We're very glad to have you and appreciate pre your taking the time. Well, I appreciate the invitation and do feel free. I'll leave you with my card. You can email or call if you want, if you need some follow up. And the, you have a copy of the PowerPoint with the, the staff? Um, what I'll do is I need to make it into a PDF mm -hmm. and then I can email it to you. I think it should go. I know it's it's really big as it is now because of the maps, so I couldn't email this but or do you you can just turn it into a pdf if you want yeah we can work on that outside of what you i'll come to you probably tomorrow and we'll just you know just post it that's fine yeah yeah this is your tax dollars at work <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much thank you yeah.